This is Carla. We're at Metal Life Magazine. I have Frankie Benali from the one and only Quiet Riot. How are you doing, Frankie? I'm doing very well, thank you. So you've got a lot going on for you. First of all, we're getting ready for the Quiet Riot documentary to be widely released. I, I assume you've gotten a chance to see the film. How do you feel looking at it um, from a standpoint now in post-production? Well, you know, there's, there's been a gamut of emotions because there's, uh, it brings back a lot of great memories, but it also, you know, it brings back some uh, some sad times in uh, in my life personally and in the history of Quiet Riot. But uh, it's a it's a great interpretation, um, or rather, it's a great representation of the history of the band, um, mm -hmm. starting you know from as far back as 1975, the real time. How was the idea to do a Quiet Riot documentary? How was that approached to you? Well, initially, um, uh, director, uh, producer Regina Russell had seen quite a bit of the archive footage that I had, mm -hmm. and, uh, and at one point I had mentioned to her that I was thinking about trying to, uh, regroup and put the band back together and go out on the road, and, and she, you know, kind of just remarked that, you know, maybe that would make a great movie, and it, and it just started from there. Well, holy crap, does it make a great movie. I, I was really excited. Uh, thank you to Regina Russell and to Double R Films for letting us take a, a sneak peek at this film. And it, it's honestly, it is such a roller coaster ride. But I want to know a little bit more about the making behind this doc. Did you always get along with the idea of doing it? Was there ever a point where you were just like, you know what, I, I just, we can't do this anymore. Like, this just isn't right. Or was this always something that you knew had to happen no matter how you felt? The thing about it is that I'm a very private person in a, in a very public uh, industry. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea of, of putting putting so much out there um, initially did not appeal to me. But I was so incredibly busy and consumed with just trying to get the band back together and trying to make a success of it and trying to um, have somebody come in and, and put on the shoes that Kevin DeBrill once wore that after a very short period of time, I was really no longer paying attention to, to the movie or the people that were around me because I was just too busy, you know, bailing water out of the SS Quiet Riot. I just really did not have the time to, to sit there and, and concentrate on that or reflect on that. I just went along and lived my life. Now that you look at it, though, was it something that, that you know it, just, it had to happen? Well, I'm glad, I'm glad the film was made because I think that from um, a fan's point of view, they're obviously going to learn a lot more about the band than they ever thought really um, existed. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's also good. And I think also from, from a human interest point, uh, you know, a lot of people think that it's very easy and very glamorous to be in a rock and roll band. Mm -hmm. And it is, but at the same time, it isn't. There's a lot of work that goes into it. Uh, there's a lot of struggles and disappointments uh, and rewards along the way. Uh, but, you know, most people don't really realize that. You have an extremely great point that there's that there's a lot of work into it, but but on an, on another hand, you guys put in so much work to this band so early in your career, and you you find out very early in the movie that people really kind of underestimated you, especially when the when the hair metal movement really got on its feet. It, it felt like you know when the Motley Crues and the Dawkins and the Poison started getting out there. It, I really don't think, looking back on it, Quiet Riot was quite given the credit you were due. Well, you know, I, I think people tend to either overlook or forget the fact that if it hadn't been for Quiet Riot, a lot of those bands would have never had the opportunities that they had uh, to be successful um, on their own right. A lot of times we're not given the credit for that, and, and that fact is ignored, but it is a fact indeed, and uh, and it was clearly shown in the film that if it had not been for Quiet Riot, music history, at least as far as the uh, hair metal or whatever you want to, whatever title you want to put on it, might not have existed. So we're not responsible for anyone else's success, but we're certainly responsible for opening up the door to give everybody else the, uh, the same opportunities that we had. It sounds like you would not like, and I don't think a lot of your fans do this, associate you with the hair metal movement, even though you would think by the timeline, yes, you opened the door, but I, I wouldn't necessarily call you the godfather of the movement because you're not necessarily having a paternal attachment to that uh, movement of, of metal. Would you agree? I, you know, I, don't, I, don't have, I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with, with the title hair metal. I mean, it, it, 
I think I think people like to put things in little boxes, and uh, and that's one of the boxes they put this this style of music in, just like heavy metal or speed metal or death metal or just plain rock and roll. So I don't have a problem with the title. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't intimidate me whatsoever. I really don't care. Something that I thought was really interesting is that a lot of the movie focused on what made Quiet Riot big instead of they could have done a bunch, like like a span of songs. But really, like you, you focus on metal health, slick black Cadillac, um, come on, feel the noise. Like they're those are kind of like the three songs that just kind of really echo in your head throughout the film, rather than it being a more definitive like here's a span of everything we've done. Like it wasn't that that necessarily mattered to Quiet Riot, at least what I got from the film, it was those definitive things that count. Is that is that something that you're happy about being portrayed? Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. I think it's important to understand that people always remember um, a band or a musician from, from their greatest achievement rather than, than the sum of, of their entire catalog or their entire output and work that they've done for years. So I, I truly don't have a problem with that, and it's also represented in our lives because we do Absolutely, and I think one of those truths that's incredibly highlighted that I, I absolutely love is when you started talking about, um, like when obviously when the internet, you know, was surging and all these articles, you know, this and this metal site picking up you saying this and just the nasty comments, and then you made just one of the, the deepest statements I have ever heard, which is, you know what, I'm the only one who goes to visits Kevin's grave, so don't tell me what to do or how to do it, and I. I think that's something that today people just put on their internet masks and be keyboard cowboys, and that's something that everyone needs to hear. Well, I mean, it's, at the end of the day, it's the truth. It's very easy for, for you know, listen, I am, I am very grateful that there's so many people that now, after Kevin's passing, you know, love Kevin and are giving him the respect, which quite frankly he did not get while he was alive. But it's very easy to say, to say it. Uh, and it's very easy to type it on the internet, and it's another thing to get in your car and go and go there and actually see the reality of death. With the, with the movie "Well Out of Here," there's no way back. They're going to get a lot of clarity as as to the story of Quiet Riot and the history of Quiet Riot, both the good, the bad, and certainly the ugly um, that's in the film, because that's what real life is like. Real life is not it's not some some fantasy game where everything is absolutely great and wonderful all the time. There's going to be some incredibly cringe-worthy moments in that film, because <laughs> I was definitely sitting there cringing as I'm re-watching footage of Mark Huff. <laughs> I was like, no, no, I'm reliving this too, why? Well, there's, there's definitely things in the film that I'm not comfortable with, but if they had not been there, then the film would have been true. On a more lighthearted note, something that didn't get explained to me in the film that I thought was incredibly interesting was your um, penchant for the Japanese and Buddhist culture. Can you tell me a little bit about how you got into that, like how you discovered that part of culture and when that sort of became a, a hobby or a passion of yours? It's been a, it's been a part of my life for, for as long as I can remember. What I like the most about it is that it's not an interest that is shared by very many people. So what happens is that is that is my escape. That is where I go, where nobody in the band or none of the people that I know are interested in it. And because they're not interested in it, they don't get involved, which is exactly what I want. It is, it is my, uh, my safety zone. Speaking of open-mindedness, there was actually a study that I think you'd be interested in if you haven't read it already. The, the study... Uh, 
published by uh, Humboldt State University in the Self and Identity Journal, the study essentially found that those experiencing midlife who were youth in the 1980s, even though they were perhaps involved in risky business during their youth, they were still they they found themselves very happy and satisfied in their in their current midlife. They found themselves very open minded, very good at you know verbal task skills, highly intelligent people. And I think that's something that that really comes across if if you read this the study and cross reference it with with the uh, with the documentary. It's it's something that really stood out to me. Well, I, I think that if you live life where where you literally are at the edge of the cliff and it, and you survive it as you get older, you appreciate the depth of the drop, so yeah. to speak. Regarding the excessive behaviors, I guess, the risky business, um, there was also another quote that I love that's very true about really the whole hair metal movement. You were quoted as saying, there is nobody to tell us no about anything. Now, first of all, do you, do you think these behaviors were catalysts in any way to your, to your careers as youth? I, you have to understand that if you're going to be in this, in this industry of ours, in the music business, uh, and understanding that, that maybe less than 1% of all the people that try actually, you know, do grab the brass ring and make something out of it. I think you have to have a certain amount of, of self-assurance and a certain amount of ego to move forward. And sometimes that means, you know, doing exactly what you think is right, even if it may not be right. And even when somebody tells you no, you still go ahead and move forward because you have to have that in you. At the end of the day, you know, I've always, I've always said that success uh, is claimed by many fathers and lack of success is always an orphan. So if you're going to do it, do it on your own terms because everybody's, everybody else is going to be taking, you know, a bow for your accomplishments. But when it goes wrong, everybody hides. And this is in your referring to the sort of like, you know, the, the alcohol and the, the, the drugs and like all the excess that you guys did. This was something you did on your own time. So you're looking back at it as, yeah, no, I don't have any regrets because it was part of the deal, it was part of what happened, and we dealt with it well. And there was no blueprint. It, it, it's, not like, it's not like, you know, buy a can of paint, open paint can, get the brush, and start painting the wall, and, and you know, you're going to paint it and you're going to be done. There was no floor plan. There was no blueprint. You know, you just have to do it on, on your own terms and, and make mistakes as you go along. And, and listen, everyone has regrets to, to some degree, but, you know, sometimes regret is goes hand in hand with success. You know, all you can do is the best you can and hope that that's going to work out. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, wrapping up here, what part of the film, looking back on it, did you see that kind of made you the most introspective? I think, I think probably when, when I look at the footage and I see, you know, how, how hugely successful Quiet Riot became, because I don't, even though I still, I still go out uh, with Quiet Riot and we still perform those songs, I don't really sit around and think about, you know, wasn't it great when we did this or wasn't it great when that happened? Um, I really don't live there. So to actually see it, um, I, I almost see it as, as, uh, as a third person as it is happening to someone else, even though I recognize myself. So it's fascinating to see because you have to remember uh, many of these things happened, you know, some 30 odd years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you tend, you tend to forget what it was like. And, and fortunately, you know, we had enough material in the archives that we could actually go back and sort of relive those moments. Uh, so for me, that was fascinating to realize how, how hugely successful uh, we were able to make uh, this thing called Fly Riot. I'm so happy to, to see you guys torn around and really being just so active and having no plans of stopping. Is that, uh, is that still Quiet Riot's mission for 2015 into 2016? You know, my, my whole motivation for continuing to go out on the road is because the fans want it. So my motivation is to go out there and, and give the fans what they want and also have it come as close as I can make it uh, be the sound of Quiet Riot, understanding that, that, you know, Kevin is gone. You know, one of the, one of the greatest things about the, the Quiet Riot movie for me is also one of, one of the saddest things about the Quiet Riot movie for me, which is when I see it, I see Kevin alive. But I also know that Kevin is no longer with us. So, you know, I, I, I have to deal with that when I see the film and I have to deal with that every night, you know, when I step on the stage. You know, I, I honor, I honor Kevin's memory 
and I honor Kevin's place in quiet riot, but, but I also understand that, that life goes on, and in that I have no choice. Can you tell us anything about when the documentary is going to be released, and then also any tour or festival plans that you may have for the rest of the year? I think people are going to have to go to uh, quietriotmovie.com and, uh, and get the updates there, because we're constantly updating it you know, with information as to when the film is actually going to be released. So that's the best, that's the best place to go. I can't give you a, a definite date because I don't have one. Um, and as far as Quiet Ride is concerned, we continue, we continue to tour. I'll be playing uh, right outside of Denver um, this Friday night. We're already booked into into next year. We, we already have a couple of festivals already set up for next year. So everything is moving, uh, moving uh, on track for Quiet Ride at this point in time. We couldn't be happier for you. Our, our listeners and our, our fans are super happy that, that we've gotten to chat with you. And thank you again so much, Frankie, for your time. It's, it's truly been an honor. And thank you for spending the time with us here on Metal Life.